you hear me? Yes, Professor. Thank you very much. And this is the third lecture of this uh, instrumentation, uh, physical oceanography instrumentation, where we are going to talk about in situ remote sensing. So we, because we have, as I already mentioned, we have uh, two types of remote sensing. One is uh, remote sensing from satellite, and the other one is in situ remote sensing. So this is the in situ remote sensing, what you will see, what it really means from the point of view of the um, techniques of, of measurements. So let's start immediately. We have uh, one of the, the oldest, relatively old instrument uh, for the um, remote sensing measurements. In this specific case, we are talking about the acoustic current meters. Acoustic current meters are simply based on the principle that the sound is a compressive wave which travels uh, uh, through a medium, through atmosphere or through the ocean. This specific case, in our case, is uh, through the ocean. So uh, we have uh, uh, we have the uh, arrangement with the sound transmitter between the two receivers. So if the receiver A is located upstream from the transmitter and the receiver B uh, located downstream, if a burst of sound is generated at the transmitter, it will arrive at uh, receiver B earlier than, uh, than at the receiver A because it has been, it will be carried by ocean currents. So, uh, as, uh, uh, so the, in that way, the typical acoustic current meter has a two orthogonal sound path in order to measure two components of the, of the velocity. One is two horizontal components, uh, X and Y, uh, northward or, or uh, eastward component. And so the high frequency sound pulse is transmitted simultaneously from each transducer at the difference and the difference in arrival time for the sound traveling in opposite direction gives the water velocity along that path. So we obtain in that way uh, the, the velocity, obviously, which is very good with these, uh, with these instruments that they, they have no moving, moving parts. They are based on the fact that the, the, um, the acoustic wave travels through the, through the medium, through the water in this specific case, and there is no uh, propeller, there is no, uh, so there is no, um, there is no the, the, uh, the, the, the vein which determines the, the, the direction of the current. It simply measures the two components. It measures the component of the velocity instead of the magnitude of velocity and its direction as it is uh, the case with the classical instruments. So this is the, this is, they, they are very useful uh, for, for very high frequency measurements. They can, they can measure every time you can generate these, uh, these, uh, uh, these signal from the acoustic, uh, from the acoustic instrument. And so they are, they are very useful for measure the uh, turbulence uh, in the ocean and wave measurement, wave current. Why? Because these turbulence and wave currents are the very high frequency. They are on the order of seconds. And uh, with the classical instruments, with which have a, a rotating rotor and have a direction, a wave direction, it's very difficult to do it because they, they don't re they don't respond so quickly to changes of the velocity and the direction. So these, these kind of instruments are very useful for these high frequency, frequency measurements. And then we have a big Doppler current profile. This is, this is a very, very large and strong step ahead with respect to the previous, uh, with respect to the acoustic current meters. It's based on the same principle, but uh, have a transmitter and a receiver in one unit. The same, the same unit has a transmitter and a receiver and use the reflection of the sound wave from drifting particles for the measurement. Okay, so you have the particles which are moving into the ocean, which are moving by the current, they are transported by the current and seawater, which contains all the time a multitude, a multitude of small suspended particles. 
particles and other solid matter. So you can any type of small particles or phytoplankton or organic uh, or the organic origin or unorganic origin they are they are used as a uh, as a uh, to to help to to do the measurement to, to do the current measurement uh, the um, what is the what is the the result of this the result is that in the sea which is completely without particles you cannot measure this current with these current Doppler acoustic Doppler current profilers because there are no moving particles the, the current goes moves without taking without carrying any any type of particle with it and so there is no reflection of sound wave from the, these from the drifting particles which are not uh, which are not present and uh, we have and we have in fact the four inclined four inclined uh, uh, four inclined beams beams at right angle to each other why they are four four are four are they because they are used to measure three current components which are uh, uh, two horizontal and one vertical of flow velocity and the different arrival times indicate sound reflected at different distances from the from the transducer. So it's not that it measures only at a certain at one level, but it measures the whole uh, the profile of the current, the variability of the current with depth from uh, the instrument itself up to a certain depth. So uh, that's a very very strong. Uh, step ahead where we measure the uh, where we measure the uh, the, uh, the the vertical and, uh, velocity profile at different depth so uh, with a single instrument we obtain the vertical uh, the vertical profile of velocity there are different uh, uh, adcp designs we have a deep ocean adcps which have a vertical resolution of typically eight meters. So every eight meters, you have a one current measurements and a typical range of up to 400 meters. So with a deep water, uh, deep ocean ADCP, you can measure the currents from uh, at one distance from it about 400 meters with a resolution of uh, eight meters with every, every eight meters. Then there are also those designed to, for measurements in shallow water where they have resolution or where they measure every half a meter the velocity and have the range of up to 30 meters. So in a 30 meter depth, they measure every half a meter, they have measured the, 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 the velocity. ADCP can be placed, placed also in moorings instead installed in ships for underway measurements or lowered with the CDD lower and a and multi-sample device to give a, a current profile over a large depth range if we are talking about the uh, about, about the ship measurements so uh, they have a multiple uh, multiple purpose multiple application for for number for a large range of depths and they are they are very very versatile for different purposes and different use um, the uh, so here is the here is the measurement principle of the, of the acoustic Doppler current profiler you have this the, the, the signal which uh, is transmitted is this transmitted pulse f0 with frequency f0 and if the object is moving to earth so that means if the part if the current is, is moving toward the, the instrument uh, or if the particles are moving toward the, the instrument then uh, the received signal has the frequency has the frequency sm smaller than the uh, than the uh, than the uh, that is uh, transmitted and then you have a moving away then the, you have again the change or if if the flow is stationary then the frequency the two frequencies are equal therefore by looking at the acoustic um, and the doppler effect we can see and measure the we are measuring the, the velocity 
that's that's the measurement principle of it. How how we uh, how we uh, we uh, essentially we do it. Here is the uh, here is the uh, the, the how uh, here's the move uh, video. How do do they how do they measure? You know you can see they send the signal through the water column in three different beams. And then they obtain the vertical profile of current speed and current direction. You see, current speed and current direction, or three components of the of the current velocity. Take it, uh, consider that these uh, ADCP current profiles they measure also the vertical velocity. I don't know whether we mentioned before, but the horizontal velocity is on the order of ten centimeters per second while the uh, vertical velocity is on the order of one millimeter per second. So this is the, uh, uh, that's the uh, uh, two orders of magnitude smaller than the horizontal velocity. Therefore, the, 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 the vertical velocity are very, very small, tiny, tiny uh, magnitude. And, uh, but they are very, they are extremely important. They are extremely uh, important because they are responsible for uh, vertical processes in the ocean. You remember the El Nino, you remember the, the upwell, coastal upwelling, remember the, um, the upwelling or downwelling in the, in the open ocean due to the anti cyclonic uh, clockwise or cyclonic uh, gyres. Those velocities are very small with respect to the horizontal, the vertical velocity, with respect to the horizontal. If we have, uh, therefore, that means if we are able to measure with ADCP the vertical velocity, that means that we have uh, enough uh, uh, good uh, accuracy to measure this velocity of the order of a, of a millimeter. So this is uh, extremely important because then we, we are able to measure to determine the vertical transport of mass. We are able, in, a, in addition to the, to the estimation of the horizontal transport of mass. And uh, so that's, uh, that's, the, that's uh, another important application of the, of the ADCP into the determination of the, of the field of the vertical velocity. Acoustic Doppler current profile it can be also ship mounted. You, you can see the uh, mounted on a ship research vessel holes. You see this. There is a there is a, there is a opening here, and here is the ADCP. In each sense, here uh, toward the bottom sends the uh, sends the beams, transmit the beams, and it measures in a real time measures the. The velocity the vertical profile of the velocity. Uh, obviously, there is another thing that uh, the the ADCP, which if it's installed in such a way that can uh, transmit the data in real time to the receiving station. In that case, we will, we can have the real time data uh, on ocean currents, which is uh, another another um, important stuff as far as the. Uh, usage of the current field, for example, for the data, for the modeling, for a, for a prediction of evolution of currents and so forth. So that's, the, that's one, uh, one more application of the ADCP installed on a, on a ship. Here is how they, how they look like, you know, after sometimes being in the, in the, in the sea, they help uh, they, they have a number of organs which are which are there they, how they are put on a, on a basement on the basis of these instruments this is a special uh, uh, special uh, structure which enables putting the instrument at the bottom in order to avoid that uh, that uh, network nets uh, fishing nets are taking this instrument and bringing it to the surface and, and breaking all the all the uh, inter uh, making interruption in all the measurements. So there are a number of uh, ways how they are put into the sea and techniques which are enabling the enabling uh, the, the long term measurements because they are essentially staying there. They you don't have to be there. They are staying there, and after sometimes you recover these instruments, and you have the. Uh, 
you have the, the uh, records of the, uh, uh, of the velocity in, uh, in, uh, on the magnetic, uh, um, on the, on the magnetic tape in the, in the instrument, in the instrument housing. And, uh, here is the, how they, they can be also, uh, mooring mounted. You could, you can put it on the mooring. And uh, so they can stay on the mooring for for some time. So you see that here, for example, it has uh, uh, it has the the structure the structure which keeps it vertical and uh, looking upward. It can look upward or downward. So if you put it at the bottom or near the bottom, it can look upward and measure the uh, current profile of it. Or if if you put it near the surface, it can measure or determine the uh, current profile from the instrument downward toward the bottom. And here is the, the different part of, uh, of application of uh, ADCP. Uh, so they can be used for offshore energy applications, renewable energy. Uh, they can be used uh, uh, measurements where uh, that has been done, for example, for site selection, design and form performance, monitoring in environmental impact studies. They can be used for, uh, for tidal and wave uh, measurements uh, in some places where you want to put the uh, renewable energy, uh, uh, renewable energy uh, power plants. Uh, in a coastal application, you can use them as in biological oceanography uh, to do the wave and current measurement for oceanographic and meteorological data collection, uh, for environmental management, for determining the oceanographic characteristics of some places, for fisheries and aquaculture, current and wave data for site assessment and short and long term environmental monitoring. For navigation safety, of course, current way measuring for oceanographic and meteorological data collection, coastal and ocean engineering to make the coastal engineering constructions. You need to know the current uh, current and wave uh, uh, characteristics and so forth. So these are large applications of ADCP in a, in a then we have uh, obviously the, the oceanographic applications, direct oceanographic applications. So we have uh, in uh, some integrated ocean observation systems where we have a real time current and wave data support of uh, the integrated long term monitoring, predicting and modeling the ocean environment with time scale ranging from minutes to decades. You remember the, uh, the famous. Uh, uh, the famous uh, transect across the Atlantic at 26 degrees north. This has been done uh, where there are, there are current measurements. They, these current measurements have been measured, have been done with, uh, with ADCP. So you have a series of ADCP, more and more ADCPs, which are measuring on long term time scale, uh, they're measuring the, the current velocity. Then we have a deep and mid-water depth mooring, mooring for oceanographic research based on the measurement of seasonal, annual, and decadal variability of ocean currents. I will give you, I will give you an example how uh, we did the uh, the oceanographic how oceanographic applications work, works really in a specific case in order to uh, address the specific problem where we have used a number of uh, remote sensing, C2 remote sensing uh, instruments, ADCP oscillator on other C2 uh, remote sensing instruments in order to address a specific uh, oceanographic uh, any, and at the same time engineering problem. Then we have the in oceanographic research vessels. They are made there. Most of the oceanographic research vessels are uh, now having the, uh, the ADCP installed and, and along their path, they are measuring the, uh, the, the ocean currents and uh, um, as in the vessel 
by this vessel mounted ADCPs. Uh, and then we have autonomous underwater vehicles and gliders way there. They also can have the ADCPs installed on them. Obviously, in the case if you if they are installed on a ship or uh, um, underwater autonomous underwater vehicles or gliders, you have to know uh, the um, the velocity of the movement of the of these uh, of these uh, means of the uh, of vehicles or gliders or ships because you have to make a sum of the two velocities or the velocity measured by by um, ADCP and the velocity of the of the of the carrier of these uh, of the ADCP so you have to make the sum of these these two we have now the we have also the acoustic tomography and thermometry and uh, which is based on the fact that uh, that the sound propagates in the sea and it propagates in a, with the different velocities it propagates in a velocity dependent depending on the temperature and salinity and so uh, by uh, emitting the sound in the ocean or in the sea uh, you can uh, see the propagation of sound you can measure the propagation of sound and you can also determine the, the velocity and uh, sound propagation in the sea uh, is uh, uh, the you know it's uh, it changes and it is affected by temperature, salinity, and pressure. Therefore, in order to uh, to understand and see the to and see the, the uh, determine the the sound velocity in the ocean, we have to know the uh, the characteristic oceanographic characteristics of the ocean the vertical distribution of temperature, salinity, and pressure. So when oceanographers look at the change of an oceanographic variables with water depth, they call it the profile. This is the profile, as I told you before. Top profile of velocity, profile of temperature, profile of salinity, profile of pressure, and so forth. So here are the, the, typical, uh, the typical profiles of temperature, salinity, and atmospheric pressure, and, and pressure, sorry. And you can see that the temperature is, as uh, we have seen before, is uh, typical of this, uh, this type. We have the surface mixed layer, then you have the uh, thermocline, and then you have a deep, uh, deep layer with a more or less co co continuous temperature, uh, constant temperature. The, the, the salinity with depth is uh, is increasing and also as as a result of the sum of these two the atmospheric pressure is increasing uh, or in other words the, the weight of the water column below the uh, the, the surface is depends on uh, on the weight of the water column so the uh, from these uh, these profiles we, we can see that temperature changes a large uh, a large amount decreasing from 20 degrees near the surface the mid latitude to 2 degrees near the bottom the salinity changes more or less very very little uh, the speed of sound in water increases uh, with increasing water temperature increasing speed and increasing pressure so this is the this is how it looks like so the approximate change in the speed of sound with change in each is, is more or less like this. It's a maximum in a first, uh, first in the surface, then it reaches a minimum around the thousand meters, and then increases again toward the toward the depth. So, I, uh, so that's that's the that's the, the typical profile of, of the sound speed. And so, uh, it is, so this is it is important to understand that the way sound moves in is very much dependent on the conditions in the ocean. So, uh, so this is the first. So this is the first minimum. This is the minimum of uh, of, uh, of the sound speed, and this is called uh, again this is sound channel that lets sound travel long distances in the ocean since it travels very slowly. It travels long distances in the ocean. 
So the refraction section provides more information on how the sound speed minimum focuses sound waves into this channel. And here is the uh, here is how the the, the sound uh, sound propagates uh, in a sound channel, and you can see these um, uh, the, the, the waves how they propagate. And this is the the thousand meter depth. Where is uh, where is the sound channel axis? Okay. Here is the uh, here is the uh, propagation of the sound speed. Okay. Uh, we can. Uh, I will just mention a little bit about these things because the, the these are uh, these are used less in the oceanography. They are more used for large scale oceanography, and uh, but for a specific uh, specific studies, uh, more uh, more. Uh, application we have from ADCPs from different type of uh, of current measurements, and uh, so the, the tomography is much less uh, used. For example, this is one of the example of our acoustic tomography and thermometry, which has been used in a Gulf of Lions in a, in a uh, in the Mediterranean, where we have the number of uh, number of uh, ADCPs that this here is the combination of ADCP measurements and acoustic tomography these uh, these uh, uh, these red circular red bubble, uh, bullets are uh, acoustic tomography and here with the black down dot in it are the ADCP so they were uh, they were they are able to measure the uh, from different by different um, technology, uh, the currents. Why do why it is important to do these measurements here in the Gulf of Lions? Gulf of Lions is uh, is the area where the dense water is formed in the Mediterranean. Apart from the Adriatic, another site of the dense water formation is the Gulf of Lion. Uh, in the Gulf of Lion. Uh, there is this kind of circulation. You can see this is the cyclonic circulation, anti-clockwise circulation, which is a, 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 a which is the important uh, uh, condition <clears throat> for a uh, dense water formation site. So, and another thing is that here there is a, a cold air blowing from the continent toward the ocean. And taking away the heat from the from the sea surface uh, water, so these two processes are making that this is the place where the dense water is formed. Therefore, it is important to do the to do the current measurements and see how intense is the this uh, counterclockwise gyre here, which represents the preconditioning uh, of the structure of the ocean currents. <coughs> And, um, and here ADCP are used also to, to do the vertical, to do the measurements of the vertical velocity. Because if you have these, uh, if you have these uh, uh, strong uh, uh, cooling at the surface, you have a very strong vertical velocity. And if to get these, uh, to estimate these vertical velocity, you have to do the vertical velocity measurements. And the best instrument for that is the ADCP. So this is acoustic thermography, a thermometry, sorry, uh, which is not yet, uh, not yet, not has been yet used. Uh, and, uh, but uh, here, the, the, the inverse problem has been used. Instead of, uh, we, uh, uh, we are looking at the progression of the sound, uh, sound signal in the ocean and transform this into the, uh, into the temperature. So this is the, that's the, the reversal, the reversal problem in all the acoustic tomography. And uh, this, this has a very large uh, potential to be used for the, for the measurements, the, uh, for the measurement temperature on long-term time scale with a, uh, uh, 
and, and estimate the, the climate change variability. And if you want to have the uh, some uh, some uh, more uh, information on these acoustic tomography and thermometry, you can see, you can look at these uh, these sites here and um, and see what what you are interested in eventually. Now we are at a, at another at another important uh, instrument for the. Uh, remote sensing, see to remote sensing oceanography measurements, which is the coastal uh, high frequency coastal radar. <laughs> coastal radar is a shore or ship based system that transmits electromagnetic waves between 6 and 30 megahertz, which travels along the sea surface beyond the horizon by ground wave propagation and scattered back from the ocean of half electro the electronic wavelength. So this is what we call the bright scattering. So we have these, uh, these, um, uh, these frequencies uh, and these are the wavelength of these, uh, of these measurements. So this is 50 to 10 meter wavelength. And uh, they, so the, 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 the uh, reflected electromagnetic waves are ch change, have a changed spectrum caused by moving away ocean waves. So the ocean waves, which uh, which are uh, recorded with the recording, which are uh, yes, which are felt by these uh, uh, frequencies, are the waves which between ten to fifty meter wavelength. And so the Doppler spectrum uh, transmitted from the instrument toward the open ocean is. Uh, uh, it changes, we change its uh, Doppler spectrum, and so uh, the speed of the surface current uh, uh, is from that determined for the carrying the ocean waves. So the ocean wave height and the wave direction spectrum using the second order C echoes of the Doppler spectrum. So we have the the uh, coastal radar has uh, two mm, two possibilities. One is to measure the uh, the ocean wave height and wave direction. These are the wind waves, and the other one is to, me to uh, measure the, the surface currents. The, I would say that the more uh, the, the HF radar are more used to study the surface current. When I see, when I say surface currents, I say the currents of the above about one meter uh, depth in the ocean. And uh, so, um, and they have uh, what is very good with them that they give you the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, very good uh, uh, very good uh, coverage of the of the ocean surface in measuring the surface current and waves. <coughs> so uh, this is the principle of a Bragg scattering. How it is, I won't be here. Uh, Making, I won't be stopping here too much. I might, I might for the for the specific, for the your exam, you might be uh, interested in uh, presenting to everybody this kind of stuff. So instead of uh, making you a number of questions, I may uh, give some themes for which and uh, you the themes for the final exam. You may choose one of them and present this as is uh, during the. Uh, the final exam. So this is another possibility for you. So you will have, you can decide or have the my questions and reply to them, possibly, or you choose a subject and present the subject of five to 10 minutes with three to five slides. And then on the basis of that, I will give you the, the note. Okay, so this I, I will leave this as open and, and possibly um, the uh, the theme for uh, for the final exam. So one of the theme might be uh, HF coastal radar principle of measurement of surface current measurements. What is the uh, so the the Doppler current uh, spec Doppler spectrum uh, measured by one of these instruments? Is the uh, 
uh, when there is a uh, when you uh, you have the the peak the the uh, the receiving signal has two peaks uh, and these these are two peaks these two peaks are uh, due to the uh, currents uh, going toward or from your instrument toward the open sea and so the uh, the uh, Doppler uh, serve, uh, the Doppler shift is due to these uh, these uh, currents which are carrying the waves surface waves from the from the open ocean to the instrument and vice versa in measuring these uh, these Doppler uh, Doppler uh, peak we are determining the currents by algorithms which are which are provided by by instruments here is the how an example of this Doppler uh, spectrum measured during one of the experiments in the northern Adriatic and so you can see how it looks like and how you do and these are the these two peaks where you measure and on the basis of which you measure the uh, the, uh, the current surface current how this looks like <coughs> so how these uh, these measurements uh, look like and how they they were they were organized once upon a time these measurements has been done in uh, in late 90s and we had uh, <coughs> three measurement points here yeah, this is that's the that's Trieste, you can see Trieste, this Venice is here. And the idea was to measure the surface currents in this whole covering, all this area here. We have, uh, we have a three measurement point. As, as a principle of measurements of these, uh, these instruments is that it, they measure, the, they, they determine the Doppler effect uh, for the current going toward the instruments or from the instrument toward the open sea. Therefore, it measures every single instrument measures only one component of the current. So the component, component which is directed toward the instrument or from the instrument. So the radial component is measured by a single instrument. You know, but we don't, we do need we need a complete current uh, current uh, vectors. In order to get the complete current vectors, we need to have more than uh, than what more than one instrument. We need to have the the more than one instrument measure for each of them the radial component. So, uh, for example, this instrument here measures the radial component of this this area here. So every uh, uh, for every single uh, direction it measures the radial component but this, these are the only radial components in order to do have a complete velocity we have we are added another side which has this coverage here and this guy measures the uh, radial components in this specific place so combining the the two radials you can obtain you can obtain velocity but it's it's good to have a third one because this third one helps you to determine with more accuracy the complete vector. Because um, in, in, in a ideal case, in order to determine the complete vector, you have to have the, the perpendicular components. But here you don't have perpendicular components that have that therefore having a three uh, three instrument is a much more uh, accuracy accurate than, than than having only two of them. So this, the, the, uh, 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 finally, the, the, entire, uh, the entire area is uh, covered by these measurements is this one here. And uh, here is how it looked like. These are the series of antennas and this series receiving and, uh, and uh, emitting antennas are uh, put along the coast. They uh, emit antenna. Uh, they emit the signal and receive the signal, and on the basis of that, they are determining the uh, the, the uh, Doppler shift has been measured and determined. Here is one example of these uh, these measurements. You can see that these, uh, uh, for example, the, the position here enables you to determine the series of the uh, of the radial components. And another one is here, and the third one is there. 
And so the combining these three here, you can you are able to do the, to uh, reconstruct the current field over the entire area. Let me see. Let me show you a little bit larger. And you can see the combination of these three gives you the possibility to reconstruct the current in this uh, in this entire area, yeah, the total the total current field. <clears throat> the so what uh, what one can see from here is that the uh, the the, high, the spatial resolution is much higher much higher than any other type of measurements. It's higher then uh, ADCP obviously ADCP is put uh, has very high vertical resolution from half a meter to eight meters in function of the coverage but in a span in a horizontal it can have a very very uh, very uh, it has very poor uh, resolution because you can put you cannot put so many instruments as ADCP says as they are as you have measurements here but the problem with this, uh, as with other uh, uh, surface uh, and remote sensing measurements, it did that this measures only the surface current. Therefore, only again, only combination of number of instruments gives you the possibility to obtain the entire spatial and temporal variability of, uh, of the of this in this specific uh, case of the of the current field. The so the, the uh, in this specific case, the, uh, the the spatial variability is on the order of five kilometers. So every five kilometer on the grid of every five point, uh, every five kilometer points, you get the information on the velo on the velocity and direction, on the speed and direction of the current surface current. Uh, on the other hand. The, the temporal resolution is also very high. You know, every hour, you can obtain the complete velocity. So this, this is the huge amount of data and huge amount of information you get from this kind of, of instrument, which is relatively easy to, to maintain. You put it along the coast and you do, do the measurements. The data are received in a in each of these, uh, this point has its receiving station, and uh, then all the data then is sent to the central data center, which where they are, they are uh, analyzed and uh, the, the calculations of the total velocity uh, current field has been done, calculated. Here is the how it looks like. We have uh, here the uh, on the other, another project, but where again the HF radar, high frequency radar has been used. You see, these are the points one, two, three, and four points. Again, we have more than uh, one point in order to get the complete current field. You can do a number of, uh, you can do a number of. Uh, since you have these this kind of measurements every hour and you can maintain your measurement site for a longer period of time uh, that means that you can obtain the characteristics of the wave of the wind field of the sorry of the current field for different wind conditions for uh, for different tidal conditions uh, or you can eliminate tides and look what is happening with the wind field and so forth so this kind this specific uh, pattern has been maintained for one year so we obtained uh, we can we, we obtained the uh, with a very good precision with a very good uh, large uh, number of data the uh, response of the of the current field to the to the influence of the uh, of the wind and also to to obtain the, the horizontal pattern horizontal structure of the of the current field on a very small time on a very small landscape you can see that here for example which has not been uh, known so far that there is this kind of a small scale structure this is the kind of a clockwise gyre where the current comes from south and makes and then turns and flows along the coast 
this is again here is the here is the goal from Trieste. Trieste is here, and uh, so that you can see that the, the number of information we obtain in this uh, with this kind of measurements are much more rich, more rich uh, uh, with respect to the measurements what you obtain, for example, for ADCP with a relatively poor horizontal spatial resolution. Here is the uh, here is another example uh, uh, the, of the surface current field. You can see that uh, how this varies from the, this with respect to the previous one. You can see that the, all the currents is flowing from the coast toward the open sea. Here, obviously, and we have noticed that, and we have confirmed that, that there, there was the wind blowing from the coast toward the open sea. So it's a kind of a bora field, uh, bora wind, and this generates these currents flowing from the coast toward the open sea. So here are the some links where you can find the uh, the uh, the data. Uh, from these uh, these measurements, and you can see the uh, what what has been obtained from uh, in OGS uh, in our institute, or in in general in a number of uh, uh, radar sites sites over the world ocean. For example, in uh, along the coast of California, there are a number of uh, of measurements radar measurements uh, from the coast up to two hundred kilometers from the coast. To obtain the long-term records of the of the evolution of the coastal currents in that uh, in that specific area, yeah, for the monitoring of how this current uh, uh, evolves. So that's uh, that's these are the links where you may you might be interested in uh, looking at. And oh, this is, these are the uh, these are the um, this is the in, these are the the examples of the in situ remote sensing data remote remote sensing instruments now i will be uh, showing you uh, an example of of the approach with these uh, uh, remote uh, of this uh, remote in situ in situ uh, remote sensing instruments usage of these instruments in specific studies and to give you this uh, idea how it looks like, I will, uh, I will, um, uh, uh, let me start, sorry, I will, I will give you, uh, uh, present to you the, uh, uh, what is this? No. Okay, let me see. I will uh, present to you the, uh, Here it is. I will present to you how we organize a specific experiment in the Gulf of Venice, uh, in Venice Lagoon, for the Venice Lagoon case study. And using all these, uh, these instruments, which I, I already prepared for you. Let me, uh, let me go to, uh, to the, um, Sorry. Uh, share the share the screen. Here it is. Okay. Okay. So I will uh, tell you a few words on how uh, we uh, what essentially we have done with these. Uh, with our studies in a specific case of the Lagoon Venice case study. And uh, to, give, to illustrate for you uh, the, the, the important uh, application of these instruments, how they are, how do you, can you plan your, inst your, uh, your experiment, your measurements in order to use uh, in optimal way the um, potentiality, pot possibility of these uh, of these instruments. What we have as a problem here, as a problem, oceanographic problem, and then uh, 
as I mentioned you to before, an engineering problem is that we have this uh, the Venice Lagoon, which is suffering from flooding, and uh, the, uh, the the flooding in the water which enters these three inlets. These are three inlets where the water enters and then floods the city of Venice, which is here. And <laughs> the thing is, uh, what we have as a as a question that we should address is uh, the, uh, the the volume of water which enters into these uh, into these uh, into these three inlets. What is the uh, the the time scale of these uh, water exchange pattern between the Venice Lagoon and the open sea? And what is the amount of water which enters in a minute, in a uh, unit time? And what are the meteorological conditions in which these uh, these water which enters the lagoon is larger than uh, normal or exits in a situation which is lower than normal? So essentially, what what we are supposed to do, we are supposed to measure the water transport in these uh, these three inlets, preferably at the same time preferably long enough in order to obtain uh, information on a long longer time scale and to understand its its variability from the time scale from uh, from the order of hour to the order of to the seasonal time scale therefore we were supposed to plan an instrument an experiment or experimental approach to this thing uh, which would be uh, long at least uh, several years and in fact we planned this instrument and uh, this experiment for uh, it, uh, it had the duration of about six years so uh, uh, we uh, should find uh, the way how to measure the currents in these these three inlets we have a, a problem here because these three inlets are have, have uh, suffered of very heavy traffic this one, this inlet, Lido Inlet, is a uh, uh, is uh, here is the Venice Lagoon in Venice City, is the uh, is the inlet where uh, typically these large cruisers pass through and then enters here, passes near the Venice Lagoon, unfortunately near the Venice City and goes to the uh, touristic uh, to, to the touristic uh, um, to the touristic harbor which is here. So unfortunately, I'm saying unfortunately because of the single this luck, enormous cruiser which are passing in front of the city of Venice and seeing them being larger than any, any other uh, house in Venice is really terrible. Here, uh, this inlet here is uh, mainly uh, reserved to for the passage of, um, of uh, you know, big, uh, um, petroleum uh, ships, which are taking again, unfortunately, taking the petroleum to this uh, to this harbor here, to the industrial harbor here, about a million uh, tons of uh, petroleum passes through this. Uh, this like, can you imagine what would be the uh, the ecological disaster if some something happens here, some accident happens in the lagoon. And then there is a Kyoja Inlet, which is reserved for the small uh, fishing boats, which are mainly staying here in a, in a fishing harbor on, of Kyoja. So these are, this is the situation. So we were not able and we were not supposed to put the uh, surface moorings or anything else in surface, which will, uh, uh, which, which will be uh, which will be um, uh, which will obstruct the uh, the tra tra ship transport here in this area here. This is a heavy heavy uh, ship transport in this area here. Therefore, the only thing what we were able to do is to put the ADCP. But to put the ADCP at the bottom, we cannot put. We could. We were not able to put the ADCP at the surface, looking downward. But we should put. We should have put the uh, the ADCP at the bottom, looking upward. 
here the, the depth of these inlets is from uh, 20 to 30 meters because here the big ships are passing. So we put uh, <clears throat> at each single inlet, this one is like one point uh, something kilometer wide. This is eight point kilometer, 800 meter wide, and this is 400 meter wide inlet. We put, we were able to put only one uh, ADC per inlet. Okay, and so this is what we have done. We put them uh, an upward looking uh, uh, ADCP per uh, inlet at each single uh, at each single inlet. Then another thing what we have to decide is to determine the the, the, the frequency sample. We should sample the 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 instrument the uh, the currents, we should measure the currents every half an hour. We cannot do it uh, uh, far, uh, more frequent than that because uh, the, uh, the, more, the more frequent you are uh, measuring the, uh, the, the capacity of the memory of the instrument is smaller. Therefore, uh, and we cannot do the servicing of these instruments more than uh, once in half a year. So every six months we did the servicing. This is one thing. So uh, we had to decide. But uh, half a uh, half an hour of sampling is very good. It's not bad because it can also measure the uh, the, the tidal currents. It's, it has enough resolution to measure the tidal currents. And we presumed that the tidal currents are very very important. The another problem what we had is that. We don't have so also only to measure the uh, the velocity, but we should measure also the transport, the water volume transport across the uh, these inlets, because this is what uh, we are interested really in. We are interested in how much, <clears throat> what is the amount of volume of water which enters the lagoon, which then is redistributed over the the Venice Lagoon and which causes the uh, the uh, the flooding of the, of the city of the city of Venice. Therefore, we should somehow estimate with each uh, current velocity measured with a, a single ADCP in each inlet. We should um, determine what amount of volume is uh, associated with these uh, with these currents. How do we do that? How did we do that? We did a very very nice uh, <coughs> very nice. Uh, uh, approach is that we uh, we use the uh, shipboard ADCP ADCP put on a small boat and <clears throat> we cross these uh, these inlets uh, uh, every uh, uh, every time possible in order to obtain number of, uh, and we estimate the, uh, the, the vertical profiles or the vertical, we estimate the volume of water it passes through the inlet for each single passage of the, of the boat over the, crossing the, the inlet. So what we obtain, we obtain <coughs> the estimate of the volume which passes from the lagoon or to the lagoon, enters the lagoon. Uh, for a specific for number of uh, time time moment for the number of time uh, uh, moments on one hand on the other hand we had at the same time measurements of the ADC of the current profile at the bottom from a fixed ADCP by doing then the uh, by connecting these two we are obtained we obtain uh, and uh, we obtain, let me tell you, oh, here it is. Okay, let's first, here is the, uh, let's, before we go on with this, this is, these are the, the, uh, the, uh, the inlet the longshore currents. <coughs> you see that here are they measured at uh, cell one, which is 18 meter depth in, a, in one inlet, then at 11 meter depth, at four meter depth. And you can see is these are uh, that these three curves they are more or less uh, 
very, very similar to each other. That, what that means, that means that the whole water column from the surface to the bottom or enters or exits from the lagoon. You see, this is the zero and positive velocity means entering velocity and negative means exiting velocity. So the whole water column enters or exits from the lagoon for uh, uh, during a, during the tidal period. This is a, you can see this is one day from here to here is one day, and you can do two peaks of entering or exiting uh, currents associated to the to the to the tides. And these are very strong currents. You can see that. But we are talking about the one 1.5 meter per second, which is, uh, if you remember that we are talking about the, when we are talking about the largest current, which has ever been measured, which are the most, uh, the, the, the strongest current in the world ocean are the Gulf Stream. And this is the, that's the order of nine of the Gulf Stream. But this is as obviously the importance of this of these currents from the global point of view is very, very limited. Let's see if, if not zero. One, one per second is, uh, has uh, importance on the climatic scale. <clears throat> so this is the, this, these are the first, uh, first result what we obtain. We obtain that the major variability of the current is, uh, is happening at the tidal, at the tidal. Uh, what is the uh, what is the uh, the horizontal distribution of these currents? This these are the profiles. These are the profiles across one of the tra or one of the inlet, which is deep, like a fourteen meter deep. And uh, we did what we did. We crossed the uh, we crossed the inlet uh, from one side to another with this small boat. With the ATCP installed on it, and we measure these currents for uh, entering or exiting current. And you can see that these currents are all over the inlet is about one meter per second, 1.4, and they are rather homogeneous. And there are some uh, some places where you have a uh, where you have the inversional current passing from one part of the inlet to another. Or this is another inlet, which is the Kyoja, which is the, the smallest one. And you can see that they are showing <coughs> essentially the same thing. <clears throat> so if we integrate this thing here from over the time, we obtain the transport because integrating spatial integration of the currents gives you this, uh, the volume per unit time, which is entering or exiting the lagoon. If we have enough large number of points for uh, for uh, and uh, where we determine or evaluate the transport, then we are able to connect the current measured by the fixed ADCP with these with these guys here, and we obtain then the uh, for each measurements for the fixed ADCP we obtain the uh, estimated volume transport. Uh, and here is the here is the that's the that's the result of these things. These points here, let me increase a little bit. These points here, for example, this is one for uh, for one inlet here. This one here. What you can see here is these points. They are these are measured by ship shipboard ADCP. The uh, the. The continuous line is the regression, is the, 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 uh, the uh, regression between the transport and the current velocity uh, measurements with the ADCP, vertically averaged ADCP obtained from the fixed ADCP. And you can see that the, the relationship between the water transport obtained by the shipboard ADCP, which crosses the, the inlet, is more or less uh, linear with respect to the to the ADCP vertically average velocity. Why we did vertical average velocity from ADCP? Because as we have seen here, we can average the, uh, easily, we can uh, use the vertically average velocity because they change for different depths, they, they change very little. So we did the vertical averaging and this vertical averaging 
he has uh, gave us this results. The vertically average velocity we related to the transport. So for each mo moment, for each measurement from a single uh, from a, uh, from our um, uh, fixed ADCP, we are able to obtain from the time series of currents from fixed ADCP. We are able to obtain the time series of the volume transport of the transport of the water which enters or exits the lagoon. So this is how we finally obtained. We finally obtained the, 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 the volume transport, which is which is something which is uh, which is extremely important. If we are talking about the uh, the uh, about the flooding of the Venice, because this volume which enters the lagoon or exits the lagoon, uh, they are distributed over the over the the entire uh, over the entire uh, lagoon. And here, uh, here is what is happening. Uh, here is what is happening. And these are the transport in meter cubic per second as an average monthly average. So we are able to reconstruct the uh, the monthly uh, average volume transport for these uh, one year, for example, for these uh, one year and a half for the, the for the different uh, for the different uh, inlets. This is uh, how we uh, end up with the, obtaining the, the amount of water which enters or exits the lagoon, which then is responsible for flooding of, uh, of, uh, of the city of Venice. Okay. Let's go. And uh, another thing what is, uh, what is interesting also, and what we are interested also is uh, uh, let's look at uh, what is happening on a yearly basis. On a yearly basis, we shouldn't have uh, uh, big differences between the uh, between the uh, uh, water entering the lagoon or exiting the lagoon. The differences possibly uh, arise from the fact that there is a uh, uh, fresh water entering the lagoon by rivers or by by rainfall. And so what we have done, we have done some uh, uh, statistics. We have done some uh, estimates, for example, for for one year of uh, water volume measurements at the uh, lagoon. And we can see that, for example, in the Lido Inlet, which is the biggest one, we have the, the, uh, the prevailing entering the water volume of about 100 meter cubic per second. At the same time, at the other two, we have uh, 170 meter cubic per second or exiting. Now, obviously, the one questions uh, one puts the question mark. Here is not uh, this is not zero. Why this is not zero? Is we have like a, like a uh, 60 like a 60 meter cubic per second uh, extra um, water uh, in the lagoon. Which is not, uh, which is not there. Uh, 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 which is somehow uh, is uh, not uh, in equilibrium. What is entering there, and this is due to the river runoff and uh, uh, rainfall. So river runoff and rainfall is like a seventy meter cubic per second. It contributes to the uh, to the freshwater uh, balance. Here is the <laughs> here is another multi-year <coughs> multi-year uh, estimates of these uh, of these uh, of the net flux through the water lagoon. Here is this uh, this blue continuous line. Blue continuous line gives you the net flux. So that means the the the, uh, the, the flux which uh, exits from the lagoon. Uh, uh, estimate from our measurements of the volume uh, at the inlet. And here with the red stuff, we are, we asked to be prepared, present the rainfall data. And you can see they, these two are independent in a sense that we have measurements of rainfall data from a certain number of uh, meteorological station. And on the other hand, we have a net flux of water through inlet lagoon. These two 
obviously, as you can see here, they are perfectly fitting each other. The larger is the rainfall, the larger is the flux. The lower is the rainfall, the lower is the rainfall, and so forth. So they are per so this gives us the uh, the um, uh, this gives us the the, the the feeling that we are in the right direction. We are estimate a very good precision of the transport. <coughs> okay. So, uh, uh, reassuming is that we have the um, that we have estimated the the, uh, the, the lagoon in average. The lagoon, in average, uh, exchange on monthly basis around 100 meter cubic per second per per inlet, and, uh, and the, the, these uh, these this amount of water is something which is then redistributing uh, on the on the uh, along the uh, the uh, along the. Uh, Total surface of the lagoon. If if you imagine that the <coughs> the, the the lagoon is uh, uh, the average depth of the lagoon is half a meter. Only half a meter is the depth of the lagoon. You may ask yourself, but how all these big ship enter this? Because what they did, they they built the ch channels <laughs> where these big ship are passing through. So all these uh, <coughs> tankers were. Cruisers, they have a space only uh, determine the uh, number of channels where they are passing. They cannot go anywhere, anywhere they want. They just have to follow the channels. <laughs> if you add to this half a meter average depth, if you add another meter, so it's a three times uh, deeper lagoon than it is in a, in a normal, normal situation. So it's a huge amount of water. <laughs> Okay, so another thing what is uh, what we are interested in is that the uh, how is the, 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 the pattern or how uh, important is the uh, the inflow the, the water exchange between the lagoon and open sea at the situation in the flow feed near the near the lagoon. In order to do that, we used another uh, remote remote sensing instruments, which are HF radar. So <clears throat> we we would like to obtain to know what is happening with this one meter per second of the current, which happens with it when it, once you know, the, the current exits the, the Adriatic. On one hand, on the other hand, <clears throat> since we know that the uh, that the, the wind field. That the wind is responsible for uh, inflowing or outflowing currents in in through these three inlets. We would like to know how is the the pattern of currents with the, with the different uh, wind conditions. So what we have done here is that we put uh, the, uh, the two antennas. One is one is here, and one is here, and here in that case we had the two antennas and determine the radial currents uh, uh, and on the basis of radial currents we determine the total current flow and this is the uh, this is an example of the coverage of this area with a uh, with these measurements here <clears throat> what we have done then we have done the uh, the what we call the conditional sampling we would like to know how these current field and here also we have done the measurements for at least, uh, if I remember well, one year. What we would like to know is how this current field, surface current field, responds to the different uh, wind pattern. And uh, the uh, so we have to somehow to the, to uh, uh, group different meteorological conditions, different wind conditions, in a, or in function of the of the wind speed. First of all, let's look what is happening if we have in front of us 
the, uh, the situation where the wind is relatively weak in the calm situations. So when the wind is, uh, uh, is not stronger than 0.7 meter per second. I mean, these are the calm situation. And this is one of the, uh, of, or one of the example of this uh, flow pattern. You can, you may, you may see immediately that the, uh, that this is the, uh, that's, this is the situation when the uh, current, when the, the, the tidal current are exiting from the lagoon from the outside. And you can see that already at, uh, um, I would say at, uh, uh, say five kilometers, six kilometers, you don't feel any influence of these currents which are exiting from the lagoon. Even though they are one point or 1.5 meter per second, they are completely, uh, their signal is completely lost already at five kilometers from the coast. And then the, the, the average flow, uh, surface flow of the Adriatic takes place. And then we have the, the this, is, this is the tidal outflow, okay? If you look at the tidal inflow, <coughs> if the, the currents are stronger at point meter, 0.7 meter per second in calm situation, again, I can remember the calm situation, then you can see that with respect to the previous one, the, the here is the current from the <coughs> lead inlet from to outside, and here is to inside, okay? And then again, these uh, four or five kilometers from the coast, there is a feel the, the, the suction is felt uh, while uh, you already at a five kilo, uh, kilometer more distant, you don't feel any, any influence of the, of the suck, water suction from the Venice Lagoon. This is something potentially very, <coughs> very, uh, interesting uh, result because it what it says it says that uh, whatever is found if you are talking about the pollutants or whatever whatever is four or five kilometers far away from the lagoon it won't be sucked into the so no, nothing which is uh, which is in the lagoon venice uh, which is outside of the venice lagoon and which is a pollutant cannot endanger the lagoon if it's farther from uh, this is further like a five kilometers from the lagoon. That's a very potentially very uh, very interesting uh, very interesting result, which can give us the idea uh, what can uh, endanger the lagoon from the point of view of the of the pollution. You know, pollution is uh, uh, is uh, very important for such a closed system as Venice Lagoon. Therefore, this information can be of a very, uh, of, uh, very of essential importance. <clears throat> what is happening in, with the southeast wind? Southeast wind is blowing from here, from uh, from here, and then blowing this direction here. And this wind, as we, as you remember, this wind is uh, the wind which generates typically the uh, the Venice Lagoon flooding. And it generates the Venice Lagoon flooding. Why? Because on one hand, it is uh, pushing the water. It is uh, pushing the water toward the opening of the Venice Lagoon. You can see here clearly the current blowing this direction here toward the Venice Lagoon. And then here is also causing the entering the, uh, the water into the Lagoon of Venice. There are some small scale structures, some small scale eddies uh, here, for example, here behind the, uh, the, the, the Lido inlet, which is on the order of a kilometer or two. But generally, what you can see is that there is a, a, a flow toward the uh, in Lagoon inlets due to the Shiroko wind. If you remember, I told you that uh, there is another <coughs> meteorological parameter, meteorological condition, which determines the, the the uh, lagoon when it's flooding, the lagoon city flooding is the uh, the low atmospheric pressure. So combination of the low atmospheric pressure, which doesn't influence the current, and the uh, and the Shirok and the southeast wind, which does influence the, the the flow, 
generates this uh, this uh, inflowing currents into the Venice Lagoon. So this is clearly this is clearly seen from this picture here, and uh, and you can see that the, the, the pretty large part of the uh, of the of this belt what we were studying with a with a uh, HF radar are influencing the lagoon from the point of view of pollution. So in the case of pollution, the influence of the of the of the southeast wind is not relevant. It can bring a lot of pollutants into the lagoon itself. Okay. What about the northeast wind? Northeast wind is uh, is here in this northern part of the Adriatic. It's very important. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I think you have you have experienced the northeast wind, which is Bora. <coughs> this is the bo bo wind obviously blowing from northeast. <coughs> this is one of the strongest north north uh, strongest wind in this area. And you can see with respect to the uh, with respect to the to the Shiroko wind. First of all, the Shiroko wind is much weaker. And then blows from the from the opposite direction. And here is how the, the flow of it looks like. So we have the, the current, which is very strong and uh, intensified in a, a narrow coastal area of about uh, five to six, uh, five to ten kilometers. You can see the belt of five to ten kilometers, <coughs> very strong <coughs> long short flow, but what is uh, also seen that the uh, that the uh, that the Bora wind, the, the northeast wind, generates the flow which with the, has the uh, the component toward the toward the lagoon. So sometimes the the flooding of uh, Venice can happen also with the northeast wind, not only with the Shiroko wind, but the southeast wind. But the, the, the what is what has been noticed here? We have here is Venice city, and here is a city of Chioggia, which is the the city which is uh, present here. City situated in the southern part of the of, of the Venice Lagoon. Sometimes with this Bora uh, situation, this city here is flooded. So. Uh, and it's flooded first of all because there is more water entering into the Kyoja inlet, and then along it in the lagoon itself, the the water is pumped or um, pushed toward the southern part of the lagoon, causing the flooding of this, uh, this Kyoja city. <coughs> uh, here is the calm situation. Calm situation with uh, with not uh, well defined uh, tidal conditions, and this calm calm situation uh, reflects what is uh, what is the what we call uh, uh, thermohaline circulation. So the circulation of the Adriatic as a thermohaline circulation of the world ocean circulation, which is due to the horizontal gradients of temperature and salinity or horizontal gradient. Or the or the or the pressure, and here you can see that what we have known also before is that the flow is a, a longshore flowing southward with some uh, small scale structures. This time, um, uh, downflow from the from the from the uh, Lido Inlet, and it flows southward. Uh, and so that's the situation with the calm meteorological conditions. And if you are, <coughs> if you are talking, that's the third category is the, so we have a Shiroko, we have a Bora, and we have uh, all other winds, all other winds stronger than, uh, than uh, I think I, we put uh, uh, two meters per second of the wind field. And you can see here, that there are some small scale structures, um, and the, essentially the current is uh, southward, as in a thermohaline, as in a thermohaline uh, circulation or calm situations. And this is what what I told you before. 
a uh, few time a uh, few lectures before this is how this uh, this problem has been solved thanks to also to our uh, to our studies which helped i don't know to what extent i must say helped to uh, to 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 uh, to prevent the flooding of the venice lagoon by installing these uh, these moving uh, dams which are covered with uh, which are closing the lagoon in a, whenever the high tide is uh, is um, predicted. Okay, so that's uh, that's it. I hope I will. Uh, I had uh, uh, I uh, succeeded to uh, illustrate to you what is the uh, what is finally, uh, and I think for from my point of view, apart from uh, having knowledge of uh, of the main uh, characteristic of the functioning of the instruments and um, principle of its functioning, it's important to know how to, to uh, uh, use these instruments in order to uh, do the oceanographic experiments. So the, uh, that is why I wanted to dedicate uh, enough time, uh, a lot of time to, to uh, illustrating for you uh, and uh, the example from a real life where we uh, uh, help to resolve environmental and engineering problem in the concrete case of the Venice Lagoon. And um, so that's uh, that's all what I wanted to say. And uh, so we won't see each other on Wednesday, hoping that I will survive the vaccine. And uh, we will see each other on Friday. So we have the last lecture of this set of, uh, of this uh, descriptive oceanography, descriptive physical oceanography uh, lectures we will have on Friday at nine o'clock. And after that, you, the, you will have the continuation of the course and, and so forth. About the uh, about the final exam, <clears throat> the last uh, through two, three generations, I was, uh, I was, uh, as I mentioned to you before, I was uh, uh, giving number of uh, uh, subjects, number of themes, which uh, all, all students can choose and present a, a kind of, uh, uh, and, and give a <clears throat> PowerPoint presentation on the subject. <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> and uh, talk about that, which is to a certain extent <clears throat> is uh, maybe uh, easier on one hand. On the other hand, you would uh, you would learn how to address a specific um, specific subject and how you you would pre present the. the uh, how you present to a public. I think that's that's a pretty pretty useful thing. But nevertheless, <clears throat> who of you is not uh, very happy with this kind of uh, of approach? You may always uh, decide to uh, to do the uh, classical exam. So that means uh, I will give you the, the the question and you will answer. And on the basis of that. <clears throat> I will judge whether you satisfy or not, and to what extent you satisfy the the, the exam. Okay, but about that we will uh, talk. Uh, we'll have a possibility to talk. Uh, okay. Okay. So have a good time, and uh, see you. Uh, see you on Friday. All right. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, I'm clear. Bye. Bye. Bye.